people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. Ahead of their long-awaited, long-anticipated showdown this upcoming weekend, Clarissa Shields on Marshall's Knockouts. She's knocking out smaller girls with losing records. Really surprised that she's still saying stuff like this so close to the fight. When the truth is, both Clarissa Shields and Savannah Marshall have fought smaller girls, naturally smaller girls than themselves. The difference is Savannah knocks them out. Clarissa doesn't. It's good matchmaking, Shields said. That's it. She's been gifted a whole lot of tomato cans. I guess her friend Hannah Rankin must be one of those tomato cans. It's a common opponent between them. And I mean, I'm not wrong. If I go to BoxRec and you read off her opponent's records, you're gonna see that. Okay, she knocked out this girl on three days' notice, but look at her record. She fought her on a week's notice. Look who she knocked out, you know? Look at this girl's record. Four wins and 25 losses. Her and April Hunter have similar opponents. How, when April April Hunter is a 140 pounder, or is she 135? How does a 168 pounder and a 175 pounder have similar opponents with a 140 pounder? Well, it's the same way that you and a 147 pounder have similar opponents. Remember Ivana Habazin? Ivana Habazin is a common opponent between Cecilia Brakus and Clarissa Shields. When she fought Cecilia, it was down there at welterweight. When she fought Clarissa, it was up there at junior middleweight. This is what I mean. I don't know what Clarissa's doing. She's pretending she's never fought smaller girls before. She already has. On several occasions, Hannah Gabriels came up from junior middleweight to middleweight for the fight with Clarissa. The bulk of Hannah's career was spent at junior middleweight. So when I see Clarissa saying these things, I just ask myself, how could she still be saying stuff like this so close to the fight when the same things you're saying about Savannah can be said about you? With the difference being, you didn't stop any of those smaller fighters, did you? She did, along with one or two common opponents between you. It just seems like she's talking because she's got a mouth. It seems like she's just saying shit to be saying shit. She says, I mean, there's somebody up on her record with an 11 and 67 record. 4 and 25, Shield said. Those are not opponents you knock out and say, oh, that was a tough fight. That was a hard knockout. It's like, no, her best knockout was against Hannah Rankin. And Hannah Rankin, it was a lot that played into that fight, and I'm not gonna hold that because when I watched the film, it all made sense. So we're gonna have to wait until the fight gets a little bit closer until we actually speak on it. You mean start making excuses? for it. Start making excuses why she knocked out Hannah Rankin and you didn't. And are you gonna do the same thing when it comes to Femke Hermans? Yet another common opponent between you that she knocked out and you didn't. She also has a common opponent with Franchon Cruz. Ashley Curry who Savannah Marshall fought in 2019 and stopped in 2019. 2021, that same Ashley Curry shared the ring with the hard-punching French on Cruz. And with French on, she went the distance. With French on, French on couldn't stop her. Savannah Marshall did. So I think it's safe to say that Savannah's power is not the product of clever matchmaking. They can put the same girl she's knocking out in there with you and they'll go the distance with you, but they won't make it with her. They don't go the distance with Savannah. Savannah who says, I'm going to take shields into deep water and drown her. It's a factual statement, not an anecdote. You could put the same girls that Savannah fights in there with Clarissa and Clarissa won't knock them out. Savannah will. Power's real enough that she can. The power is real enough that she does. The weather power, power alone, will determine the outcome of this fight. That's what's open to interpretation. That's what has yet to be determined. Savannah Marshall says she, she being Clarissa Shield, she's had a lot to say about me, but it doesn't bother me. It doesn't get under my skin. I don't care what she thinks about anything. She's not one of my friends or family, so her opinion doesn't mean anything at all to me. We will all do our talking in the ring Saturday night. I'm going to take her into deep waters and drown her in the Thames. If Clarissa Shields' constant trash talk doesn't seem to make sense because
because it also applies to her. But she's fought smaller fighters just like Savannah has. If it applies to Clarissa the same way it applies to Savannah, in an unflattering way for Clarissa, because Clarissa didn't stop those smaller fighters, what exactly is she attempting to do? Is this a psychological attack? Is this her trying to sell a fight? What is this? I don't know. It seems like somebody who's in a hurry to say something, even if they have to grasp at straws to say it. What I'll say is that comparatively, Clarissa Shields has a better resume and has fought some better fighters than the fighters you'll find on Savannah's resume, though that doesn't necessarily make them better than Savannah. I mean, if you ask me, Savannah wouldn't have just taken Nikki Adler's belt or Christina Hammer's belt or Marie Eve Decare's belt. If you ask me, not only would she have beat them the same way Clarissa beat them, Savannah would have stopped them. Probably would have stopped Hannah Gabriel's too. She's been stopped before by a naturally smaller woman than Clarissa and Savannah. She was stopped by the Dominican Republic's own Oxandia Castillo down there at junior middleweight. When Clarissa fought her, it was up there at middleweight. And Clarissa didn't stop her. Like I said, it's hard to know what exactly Clarissa's going for when she says stuff like this. It just seems like she's not being honest about things, honest with herself. And if you are to prepare for a fight with Savannah Marshall, how are you supposed to do that when your evaluation of her as a fighter is less than accurate. She's a puncher. She can punch. That much is established. That doesn't necessarily mean that she beats you. But the power is real. That much is established. Are you under the impression that it's not? Well, this weekend, if she plants one on you, you'll see how real it is or how real it isn't. Clarissa Shields is a skilled boxer. It goes without saying, but she's not the puncher in this. Savannah is. And she's a little more than just the puncher. She has genuine boxing acumen, boxing ability, an ambidextrous switch hitter with long extremities long levers and statuesque in frame in size things are about to get interesting in men's heavyweight news former wbc champion deontay valder says the second reign is going to be a fun reign for me wbc have already started their four-man tournament this past weekend's heavyweight contest between former champion andy ruiz and world title challenger luis ortiz kicked off that tournament we all know who emerged the victor now it's time for deontay wilder's wing of the tournament to commence i've said it several times already i think he can stop robert helanius a somewhat decent boxer with decent power decent fundamentals and acumen generous physical dimensions an upright heavyweight though he's not the kind of fighter that comes in bending his knees bending at the waist he's not the kind of fighter that fights at a slight crouch with his head on a swivel he can be caught he has been caught before he may get caught again by deontay next month if deontay is anything semblant of the fighter that he used to be if he can still He'll fire that piston right hand of his the way that he used to. There's a good chance that he smokes Robert Hellenius. So if he doesn't, and it happens the other way, there are those out there who question not only Deontay Wilder's physical state, having spent close to a year out of action already, but his mental state as well. And what suffering those two crushing defeats, those two systematic beatings at the hands of Tyson Fury, what that might have done to Deontay Wilder's mind. Can he fire that piston right hand of his with the same confidence that he used to, the same conviction? Or have those two losses, those two beatings at the hands of Tyson Fury rendered him a shadow of his former self, hesitant and unsure? I've said it many times here on the channel, I'm saying it here again. Some guys lose a fight and they rebound. Some guys, other guys, they don't. They're never the same. This is particularly true of punchers, big ones, that have a lot of confidence in their power and come to rely on it. Fighters like Deontay Wilder. It'd be a fucking disaster if Deontay Wilder loses that fight. It really would. A disaster for the PBC who so wish to resurrect the bronze bomber, resurrect his heavyweight career, his heavyweight reign, shooting for a second when it would be a disaster for them. As well as a disaster for him if he's reached a point to where he can't get past a guy like Robert Hellenius. Guy who's been beat before. His decision by Dillian White, stopped by Johan Duapa, common opponent between him and Deontay Wilder, is also stopped by Joe Washington, yet another common opponent between him and Deontay Wilder. And if Deontay Wilder's reached the point to where he can't get rid of a guy like this, he might as well pack it up, call it a career, and just retire. That's if he don't make it past this guy. Because they're serving him up a guy who should be easy to knock out on a platter. Easy for Deontay, I mean, if he can return to being the fighter 
that he was. They've laid it all out for him. The WBC has left a clear path for Deontay Wilder to pick up the WBC title should it become vacant in the very near future. They've laid out that path for him. His handlers have conjured up an interesting enough opponent that can help him sell some pay-per-views. A little. I mean, those two beatings he put on Adam Kovnowski, they did leave a lasting impression. Those were entertaining fights. Entertaining fights whilst they lasted, they're putting Deontay Wilder in a very manageable situation with a guy against one who's been out of action the same amount of time as Deontay because in case you forgot, Robert Hellenius fought on the undercard of Wilder versus Fury 3. So as long as Wilder's been out of action, Robert's been out of action just as long. Oh yeah, Robert's coming off a win and Deontay's coming off a loss. Actually, Deontay's coming off of two back-to-back -back losses whereas Robert's coming off of two back-to-back -back victories, two back-to-back -back wins though all the same they both have ring rust to shake off they both have look you know who the promotion's behind so let's not beat around the bush this is all about getting wilder back in the winner's bracket this is all about getting wilder back to a title if possible this isn't about robert we all know that this is about a second title run and a second title reign for deontay wilder and this is where it starts. This is where they want it to start. Deontay himself says that his second reign, presumably his second reign as a champion and what is the second phase of his career, it's going to be fun. And you know what? He might not be wrong. He might not be. If he beats Robert, we all know their aim, powers it be. They aim to put Deontay Wilder in the ring with Andy Ruiz. That's an interesting little fight, an interesting little affair. Beyond that, Given the relationship that his longtime manager, Shelly Finkel, has with Frank Warren, possible matchups with either Joe Joyce or Daniel Dubois. I've talked about this and how those are genuine possibilities, transatlantic ones. Shelly Finkel and Frank Warren, amongst themselves, orchestrated the first Tyson Fury fight, you understand. They did that together. And now that Deontay Wilder's back, if he can make his way past Robert Hellenius and also make his way past Andy Ruiz, what they might move to do beyond that is put their boys in there with each other. Transatlantic pay-per-views. Box office fights in America and box office fights in the UK. Because that is what Wilder versus Daniel Dubois would be, or Deontay Wilder versus Joe Joyce, given the world title situation potentially becoming immaterial in the future, should those titles go vacant. Those two boys are in a pole position to pick up those alphabet titles, the WBA and the WBO. Deontay's in a pole position to pick up the WBC. You're saying that this guy might finally fight in unification matches, unification fights? I'm saying it's a genuine possibility based on the current lay of the land. If the lay of the land changes, then so do the possibilities. But if Deontay gets himself back in the winner's bracket, and Joe Joyce and Daniel Dubois, they stay in the winner's bracket. So long as that's the situation and so long as that's the case, unification fights between them are distinct possibilities. It's possible. Do you ever think, like you had with Ortiz, you'll ever have a moment like that with Fury? You know, I like I know Ali and Frazier, they hit. Nah. Okay. Never. Because I know the truth behind that. I don't, I don't, I don't condone and cheating and shit like that. I know that no matter what people say, it's just like people use, you know, you have analysts or whatever. If he, if he did has something in the club, or if he did say, why did you not go to the authorities? And I wish I was in front of them, I can grab their collar. And I would grab their collar and put them close to my face so we can be eye to eye, face to face, so much that my breath touched their face. And I would tell them, why the fuck would I go to the authorities when I have an opportunity to release my own energy and put my hands up on him in the possibility of trying to kill him and get paid millions of dollars doing it? The okay, go to the authorities. They lock them up. Then what's, what's next? That's it. A good write up. Okay, we proved our case. Nobody getting fed. What justice did they have done? That don't make no sense. That that sounds like somebody that don't that's not non confrontational That don't supposed to be in no combat sports because their mindset ain't ain't set on combat. It's set on being nice. So what's that old theory? Don't even make sense to me. Like why would we do that when we we are in the hurt business? This is what we do. I can hurt you and get paid doing it. That sounds like a sweet deal to me. Deontay Wilder still believes that Tyson Fury cheated in their fights. And he addressed many of the criticisms levied against him that if he had irrefutable proof that Tyson Fury did in fact cheat in 
one or some or all three of their fights, why didn't he come forward with it? And his response is, why would he do that when he can address the cheating with physical violence? Get paid for doing it. And the only reason people asked Deontay Wilder to come forward with this irrefutable proof was based on promises that his roadie, Tay Jones, made. That Wilder would eventually release the information that proved, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Tyson Fury cheated in their fights. And as it stands, that never happened. Listen, I don't have a high opinion of Tyson Fury or his character. I do think he's a con man, and I do think he conned Deontay Wilder. Conned him into giving him a title shot that he didn't deserve, conned him into thinking that he was just a fat guy on the rebound who wanted a few quid. He tricked Deontay because he knew that Deontay's a very limited boxer, strong puncher that he might be, he's a one-trick pony. Tyson Fury decided to return to the sport of boxing. He had a choice. He had options, the option of facing Deontay Wilder or the option of facing Anthony Joshua. And they were both unbeaten fighters at the time. They were both unbeaten champions. There's a reason that he went after Wilder instead of going after Joshua. We know in the boardroom at that time, Tyson Fury had zero chance. Zero chance of getting a 50-50 split with Anthony Joshua then, but with Wilder. That's what he got in the first two fights. And that's what he got facing a more limited boxer than Anthony Joshua, a more limited boxer who was so clearly underestimating Tyson Fury. And Tyson Fury knew that. He tricked him. He conned him. Conned Deontay Wilder. Deontay's still raw about it. He still chooses to believe that Tyson Fury cheated in their fights, offering up no proof of any such cheating. And I don't have a high opinion of Tyson Fury or his character, but I call it down the middle and I call it how I see it. Yeah, Tyson Fury's a jackass, he is. He's a shyster, he's a trickster, and he's a con man. But even with all those things, what you're proposing is too far-fetched. If he went in there with metal objects inside of his wraps or inside of his gloves, JD's must have watched him do it since he was the one who watched Tyson Fury's hands get wrapped. Tyson Fury pulled a fast one on JD's. You didn't fire JD's for it, did you? So do you really believe he cheated or are you just saying all of this as a coping mechanism because something, something deep on the inside, there's something there that you're still wrestling with. And maybe it's that you did this to yourself. Whether you think Tyson Fury cheated or you don't think he cheated, one way or another, you're the one that gave him the shot. You're the one that gave him that opportunity. And he, in effect, derailed your career, derailed your reign as WBC champion. You never had to fight that guy. You weren't under orders to do it. You had options. But that's the one Deontay Wilder chose. Time and time again, Deontay Wilder was the architect for his own downfall. And underneath it all, that's what I think he's wrestling with. There are too many holes in this conspiracy theory for me to believe it, but even if Deontay believes it, guess what? What? The guy don't get the chance to cheat unless you give it to him, and you gave it to him. The whole Glovegate conspiracy theory reads like something out of a Wiley e. Coyote cartoon. But Tom and Jerry, you're saying that this guy stuffed Acme anvils in his gloves and neither the Nevada State Athletic Commission or your own trainer, JD's, were hip to it. An egg-shaped object. You wanna know what that egg-shaped object was? His knuckles against your face. On the off chance that Deontay Wilder's telling the truth and there was foul play at work? Even in that version of the story, you'd still be the one that set those events in motion. You and your team. It's easier to blame Fury for something that you did to yourself. You never had to fight him. You chose to. 